we are going to do an extremely abbreviated update on AFC. Um, AFC for SP Power and Wi-Fi 6E. Anybody deploying that yet? Yeah, kind of have to. I spend, uh, since we came up with these, I spend a great deal of my time with government affairs folks and folks in the field going, what about and what do we do here? So there is a lot to talk about because this is evolving. Uh, Wi-Fi 6E and LPI rules. We got really nice power levels for LPI. I presume many of you have deployed it. It's not as horrible as we thought with the low power levels indoors. Things seem to cover. The other thing that we're finding out with 6 gigahertz, and we're waiting to see how this looks in large public venues, uh, but we think with 6 gigahertz with no active probing, the noise floor might stay low when we get a bunch of clients in there. So not sure that we absolutely 100% need SP power in as many places as we thought we did at one point in time. The other side of this is more power is always better for SNR. So what we got was livable. What we did with it after we got it was celebrate the fact that we got 3 dBs of noise control and got better SNR every time we doubled a channel, which made a lot of sense right up until fully understood what that 18 dBm EIRP really means, right? So when I take a look at how the other plans were laid out in the world, they had 10 and 11 dBm per, per megahertz, and we thought, hey, they're getting away with murder over there, but they still got a 23 dBm max power. So they ended up with a few more dBs of power. Good news is that makes a lot of difference. The problem, Well, the problem is we're going to go back and find that right slide. <laughs> so the SP band um, or the SP power was given to us back at the time we granted or created Wi-Fi 6E, and it's just now getting to the point where we're getting ISED uh, Canada certified finally. So as of last week, we were still waiting on DUT test results to officially do that, but we're set up in... Uh, and AFC databases for ISED coming online already. And what this gives us is more power, but more specifically, more power in that first 20 megahertz. It gives us more power across the entire band, but it comes with the cost that we're going to have to interface with a automatic frequency control or an automated planning database, if you will, of where we've got 6 gigahertz resources, because outdoors we have a lot of things that use 6 gigahertz. Um, one we just learned about, I just learned about too, was at sea. We've been talking about cruise ships and how you handle that. Well, it turns out they use a lot of six gigahertz out of satellites to measure temperature of the ocean. Apparently, it radiates at five to seven gigahertz. <laughs> so they measure a lot of that and they're concerned about interference. So the whole problem is you look at, you get three dB more power every time you double but you still have 18 dBm and 20 megahertz. And if you went out and measured this, you saw a 160 megahertz channel come in just as hot as a 20 megahertz channel. And the reason for that is you were scanning beacons. If you take it the next step, ah, I thought we fixed that one. If you take it to the next step, what you need <laughs> When you start getting a higher ceiling, is more power at that cell edge, and at 20 megahertz, you're only going to get 18 dBm forever and ever and ever. So if the ceiling's too high to get 18 dBm down on the floor and make use of it, now you're going to need an SP. Now you're going to need an AFC, and you're going to have to integrate that. It's not a horrible thing. Presently, we've got it built into the architecture on both Catalyst and the, uh, the cloud stack. We do the proxy. It's completely transparent to the user once you give it the criteria that's required. And the, the things that are required are an absolute location. So you can get a GNSS reference. From that, we can build references. But you do have to have a known location because you're going to interfere with something that's important if you aren't in the right place. Second thing is you have to take an estimate of what you think the accuracy is of that and what the height of the antenna is. But once you put that data in, you're going to get back a grant that's going to give you what they call power constraints, 
We'll paint it out for you as to what channels and what power you have, and we'll give you a really good idea how you're managing that. Boy, that's slow. <laughs> so two ways we can distribute GNSS on the back end. We can do it over the air using NDP or the neighboring protocols that we already have built into the stack, and that's actually fairly accurate. You're gonna see an air uh, amplitude magnify the further you get away from a GNSS source. You're probably gonna to wanna to have more than one source, and since this is kind of critical to you getting this power, you definitely wanna have a failover plan. So if a GNSS goes down on you or you lose that AP or that reference, you don't wanna have that impact the outcome. Second way that we can do that is by a switch connection. If you think about it, you are 100 meters from a switch at the end of your ethernet cable, you can get 200 meters between two APs period, and that's the limit. So if you do this over the switch, each stack has its own way. If you do it over the switch, it's an automatically assumed 200 meter error radius. So it's gonna say, I know my position within 200 meters. Now that bit us right up next to the water it turns out you can go pretty far over water with six gigahertz. Why do we need this? Uh, AFC is going to determine the grant. It's going to look at assets that it has. It's going to take a look at where your location is. And if that crosses over into a known six gigahertz registered transmitter, it's going to pull the power back and it's going to make it so that we don't interfere with that. And that's the primary goal. And I'm going to skip ahead because we're going to close quick. So quickly, GNSS is required. We've got it built into everything at this point in time. Clients. I did a quick search on the client database. There are two different classes or three classes of clients. You can have a dual mode client, which has been growing steadily, and we see most clients going there. I was a little surprised to see LPI clients almost doubled since the last time I checked this. So we're still doing LPI. And then SP-only clients still holding steady. That tends to be just a device on the edge of an ISP. 